We are the members of the Alaska House Majority Coalition. I'm very pleased today to be joined by, to my far right, uh, Representative Paul Seaton from Homer, co-chair of the House Finance Committee. To my immediate right, Representative Dan Ortez from Ketchikan, a member of the House Finance Committee, and the chair of the Department of Fish and Game Budget Subcommittee. To my left is Representative Drummond. Good morning, Harriet. She's chair of the Education Committee. And uh, <clears throat> we hope this morning to kind of get you up to speed on a few things that have happened, uh, certainly over the course of the weekend, but as well as what we uh, expect to happen this week with uh, an emphasis, at least this morning, on uh, education and our efforts to pass a separate appropriation bill that will <clears throat> sort of take uh, education out of the normal funding, uh, normal budget mix and fund it separately, but also fund it early. So it gives the school districts the advantage of knowing that, uh, <clears throat> that that's been taken care of as they go into their budgeting process. So by way of uh, updating you, uh, soon to be Representative John Lincoln, I think is landing in Juneau uh, here in about an hour or so. It's our plan to swear him in tomorrow morning um, on the House floor, and we will probably have a, a committee on committees to make adjustments, uh, to assign him the committees that, uh, that, uh, 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 that Representative Westlake um, occupied, and uh, to make some other adjustments. A um, few other things. I, I guess I should point out that we're here a half an hour earlier, and thank you all for being here as such, and the reason for that is the House Finance Committee is um, embarking on its first two-a-day meeting schedule today. And in order to accommodate, accommodate uh, Co-Chair Seaton's schedule, we moved our meeting time back from its usual 9 a.m. slot to 8.30 in the morning. And our plan going forward is to um, <clears throat> stick with the 9 a.m. schedule as best we can, but to acknowledge that if there's a finance committee meeting and we have a finance member on our panel, that we'll move it back uh, to 8.30 in the morning. A couple other items, uh, give you a bit of a heads up. In a couple of weeks, we are going to uh, dedicate the House Finance Committee room to L. Adams. Uh, and so that room will be known uh, as the L. Adams Committee room. And we're very pleased uh, to let you know that we've been working with Alaska Federation of Natives, with the Adams family, with a host of others that have been involved over the years with the Representative Adams in the district. And that's being planned for February 13th. We uh, are <clears throat> hoping to be able to consolidate the AFN reception along with the dedication of the room and uh, make that more or less into a combined event and a, a gala event um, as uh, well. So before we start on um, our efforts this morning to update you on our plans for uh, public education, um, I think it's appropriate that I take a few minutes to address uh, events from this last weekend. I think you all know that um, the Juno Empire broke a story about uh, Representative Ac Zach Fanzler and some alleged events that took place and that our majority coalition in a very short order made the bold decision to basically ask for his resignation. And we did that uh, knowing that, uh, that the criminal charges have yet to be filed uh, in, in the, this event um, and that we certainly um, respect his constitutional rights and his rights to privacy and that uh, as of uh, today, Tuesday morning, we have not gotten response from Representative Fanzler, but we respect the fact that it's a serious uh, decision for him and that, uh, that uh, it's a decision that uh, may take him some time to make, but uh, nonetheless, we have asked for him to resign. We've also asked that he turn in his office keys our House Rules Chairperson, Representative Ledoux, has asked that his staff be reassigned to the House Rules Committee, which uh, I believe that took place yesterday. So we've taken steps uh, in the interim to address the situation with Representative Fanzler, and um, I suspect that there may be more questions uh, when we get to the Q&A part of this presentation this morning, and at that time, we'll do our best to address the issue. In the meantime, Representative Seaton, I'll turn things over to you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, happy to be here today to talk about uh, a, an approach that we are trying to take to bring the um, financial 
conversations that are going on the budget uh, to a um, amicable and easier close. So the way we're doing that is doing something that was is not just coming from the House majority. In fact, the idea of a separate early funded uh, education budget uh, stimulated from the panel discussion that myself as chair of uh, finance in the House, um, Representative Chenault, who is the minority whip in the House, and Senator Michiki, vice chair of the education, uh, I mean vice chair of Senate finance, um, all had when the superintendents were having their conference over in Seward this last year. And this became the biggest thing that the superintendents had struggles with, uh, with all the layoffs that they were required to do, the multiple budgets uh, that they constructed not knowing what that um, funding level was. So um, that's the genesis of this. So it's not meant to be one group only. Uh, this is hopefully everybody looking at the priority that we have for Alaska, and that is basic K-12 education, agreeing that we're not going to cut basic K-12 education. So we should get that off the table by early funding that. And as you can see in the chart to the side or in this here, uh, basic K-12 education has been going down over the last years, but in uh, 2018, uh, the governor's bill and our proposal in 287, we are taking exactly the same numbers and having that be the flat funding of basic K-12 education, including boarding homes and Mount Edgecombe, which are also areas where teacher layoffs would occur. And this would get us out of this problem of having these sequential layoffs that good teachers leave the state so that we really can uh, retain good teachers and move our education system forward. However, of course, if we're going to pass an early separate budget for education, there has to be a pot of money where that's going to come from. And there are only two pots of money that it can come from. And one is the Constitutional Budget Reserve, and the other is the Earnings Reserve of the Permanent Fund. Remember, by the time July comes around, there is no money in the general fund. That's been used up for, um, for the year. And so if we're going to pass an early budget, we must def define some place to take money from. And so here's the Constitutional Budget Reserve, and you can see it's been declining over time. This is with the plan that we would have. We would have a little over a billion dollars left in the Constitutional Budget Reserve. And that's a really important thing because that means it still can be our cash flow account and our checking account uh, within the CBR. If we didn't do that, we would have to have the Permanent Fund Corporation change the way they manage the uh, Permanent Fund uh, itself and that would not be good because we count on them earning high high investments and they can only do that if they have a long-term strategy so um, if we look at the other reason why it makes sense to use the uh, constitutional budget reserve you can see that the constitutional budget reserve last year earned 1.8 percent on that was its investment earnings. It is short-term invested. You all know if you have a savings account, you're not earning much in the bank. The permanent fund itself earned 12.889% last year. So a huge difference in the earning power of that money if that 1.2 billion that we would take from the Constitutional Budget Reserve is taken from the Constitutional Budget Reserve or whether it's taken from the earnings reserve, the only other uh, funding source that has available money to pre-fund education. Now, that was last year, and things go up and down, and you can see that on the long term, it's about 2.4% that the earnings reserve, or the constitutional budget makes, and it's 6.5% uh, at the latest uh, adopted valuations from the permanent fund is their long-term goal. So what that means is if you have a $1.2 billion in the CBR over 10 years versus what would be in a 10-year strategy here, it's over $600 million difference. So that's another reason why we want to leave that in there. However, to accomplish this, 
it's, there are four groups in the legislature, all of which has, have to agree because no caucus now has a three-quarter vote. It takes a three-quarter vote to tap the CBR. So everyone has, has a piece of this. Everyone can agree that uh, K-12 education is one of our most important things and we're not going to be cutting that and we can all go forward. If we can get education off the table, I think that that agreement and that among all the caucuses in the uh, House and the Senate makes us um, a lot smoother path for getting uh, through. I would like to say that HB uh, 287 is the first thing on the plate today in House fin Finance. It's our second hearing. Uh, we're planning on uh, looking at any potential amendments and moving that bill out. So we are trying to get this done early in the session, try and get it to the Senate so they can have the consideration, give every single group in the legislature the opportunity to support fully um, early funding of education. So I know that took a little while, but uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to present the whole idea. Thank you, Representative Seaton. Representative Drummond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, early funding for public education is, uh, has been a big issue for as long as I've been involved with schools. I'm glad to join with Representative Seaton and the almost 20 co-sponsors of, of HB 287. Um, as, as, a school board, as a parent, as a school board member, as a municipal assembly member, and now as a legislator, I've been involved with funding schools. And uh, this has been a... Um, uh, political football for as long as I can remember. We talk about early funding with a sense of longing, but every year politics gets in the way. This year is going to be different. We're going to put everybody's political rhetoric to the test by passing 287 quickly and with multipartisan support. Removing public education from the larger budget process takes it off the table as a bargaining chip at, at, in the end game. And we all know, we have all heard how we don't want to run into an extended end game this year. And removing public education from that early takes care of that. It gives school districts the opportunity to plan. It gives them the opportunity to find and, and retain great teachers. And I'm glad to see some great teachers in the room in uh, 2017's Teacher of the Year, James Morris, and uh, Amy Jo Miners, uh, uh, another former Alaska Teacher of the Year. Um, I'm encouraged that the Senate seems interested in this concept. They are considering a bill uh, by Senator Gary Stevens, SB 131, that puts the uh, early funding of education in statute. Uh, the two bills are different, but the priority is the same. Get it funded, get it done early, so that school districts can plan. Representative Ortez, good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, like Representative Drummond and the rest of the members of my caucus, am proud to be the co-sponsor of House Bill 287. It's a simple bill that builds on the priority of every member of our coalition to give our children great schools, staff with skilled teachers. As you know, I'm a former teacher, and now as a lawmaker, I know firsthand the stress and harm caused 